the whole superhero vibe is very much to me a mirror of the transformation we go through to tell the truth. Welcome back to Untold Stories Beyond the Binary, episode two. I'm your host, Travel Anderson. If you're new here, Untold Stories Beyond the Binary is a video and podcast series we're doing here at EW, taking stock of this moment in increased non-binary visibility. In this video, we're gonna focus on the non-binary canon, the people and characters that we as non-binary people look at as representation, even though they may not actually be non-binary. These are, or were, our possibility models before non-binary people were as visible in society. My personal favorite was always the villain him from the Powerpuff Girls. <laughs> it is time. A red jacket and skirt moment with pink tulle, these black thigh high boots with a sharp heel, rosy pink cheeks, some facial hair, and a sickening black lip. Gotta be non binary, okay? I called up some of my non-binary faves to see what moments in pop culture they recall identifying with. The people and characters that felt non-binary to them, whether or not they're non-binary in reality. I remember seeing things on TV that I remember I thought were pretty magnificent. Things like seeing um, Whoopi Goldberg who made her money, but not in what people would consider a stereotypical feminine fashion. But she still made her, but she still was the toast of Hollywood. And then I think about um, people like Bugs Bunny, who would, uh, you know, dress up in a full opera diva outfit. Tu Wong Fu was a pretty formative movie for me as well. Why are you crying? Maybe she just found out Menudo broke up. Although Tu Wong Fu was a very interesting depiction of drag. I don't know any drag queens who get dressed in, in high horror drag to drive across the country. I don't know anyone at all that does that. Let alone, let alone drag queens. <laughs> but I still love the movie. I've been talking about Silence of the Lambs a lot. It rubs the lotion on its skin or else it gets the hose again. <laughs> yes, you will, precious. You will get the hose. Which has been really funny because all of my trans friends hate me for it because a lot of my trans friends hate Silence of the Lambs. I love Silence of the Lambs. I have a whole, I have, I have a whole tattoo about it because of how much I love Silence of the Lambs. Because it is, it is something that I recently, like as a Gen Z trans person with a lot of privilege, like I look back on it with a very different perspective. And when I watched Silence of the Lambs, it felt extremely non-binary to me because Buffalo Bill as a villain never really like self-villainizes. Like Buffalo Bill is never like, well, I want to be a woman, so I'm gonna kill people and make a woman suit. Like every single time Buffalo Bill is villainized or discriminated against, it is from specifically the like straight white guys in the FBI. Like they're always the ones being like, oh, well, it must be because they're trans that they're killing people. But it's never really the trans person's fault. And if anything, it makes a better commentary on the societal reaction to Buffalo Bill as a person than it says about why Buffalo Bill was a villain in the first place. And I find that fascinating. As a gender expressive, gender creative child, I remember watching Sailor Moon um, growing up, which like, if you don't know it that well, it's about like a group of, of like schoolgirls who turn into like, they like turn into their like Sailor, like Sailor Moon, Sailor, like Sailor Venus, like, and they like mm -hmm. go save the world and stuff. Um, and they like look really cute while they do it in like really good skirts and like cool bows on their like here. Um, and, uh, you know, I remember watching that show and I was obsessed with it when I was a kid and I didn't understand my obsession with it as queer or as trans. Um, in at the time, but really like the part that got me, the thing I loved about that show um, was there was this transformation moment. And any show that has like, especially animated shows that have transformation moments where someone goes from their regular day-to-day -day self to this like opulent, incredible, powerful, rainbow glittery version of themselves um, that's, that is then, and that's what they must become in order to save the world. Right, like literally Sailor Moon had to be wrapped in rainbow ribbons, like like in this like weird, cool, cosmic kind of transformation sequence before she became Sailor Moon and like did it, you know, and could like go go save the world or whatever. And those kinds of moments for me, those moments, th those literally the transformation moments.
where we're augmenting yourself and getting sparklier and more opulent and more interesting and, and more femme often um, made you more powerful, felt and still feels so, so trans, so non-binary, so mm-hmm. gender transcendent and, um, and really like ingrained in me something uh, of a mysticism around how I understood my gender and how I understood the power of femininity specifically. I still, to this day, when I put on a gown, I feel like I am transforming. And there's a little part of my brain where I am like getting wrapped in those rainbow ribbons and put it and, and turning into Sailor Moon and off in my armor to, sight, to like save the world. You're gonna laugh because I we, I literally just watched this movie because uh, with um, my friend and artist that I'm working with, um, she's a trans woman and uh, you know, we, we both got vaccinated and she came down to Philly and we just had a good old time. Um, it was just kicking and chilling. And I was like, no, this movie may be non-binary. And we watched it and it's this old Disney Channel original movie called Motocross. Oh my God. About, yeah, yeah, you know, you know, you know. If you know, you know. If you don't, you know. Yes. And if you don't know, I'm so sorry for it. <laughs> you beat me, you get the job. Sound fair? Fine. 12 laps then. Um, I remember distinctly just being young and being like, she's killing it as a girl, she's killing it as a boy, and she's just killing it. That, that movie made me non-binary, basically. Sometimes I think that like me as a kid had it like more figured out than I do now. I remember very specifically telling people that I was half girl and half boy. Um, when I was very young, I had this obsession with people who could change their, change their identity, change their face, change their, uh, the way they presented, especially as it pertained to gender. Um, I think that was such a fantasy for me. Um, but yeah, I was all about like, oh, there's this character, everybody thinks she's a man, but she's really a woman. I was like, I had, all of my characters were like that. And all of them had some kind of fluidity with how they engaged with those identities. So, um... Yeah, I think that it's just, it's it's kind of like I see my gender now as, as being something of a shapeshifter of, you know, it's it, it brings me joy and makes me excited to think that like, I can change my hair, I can change my clothes, I can change my body even in certain ways and, and that like changes the way I move through the world. And it's something that is just very like, it's just very fascinating. For me, it was really Revolutionary Girl Lucana, um, which is a a show that I discovered in high school. It's about Utena. As a young girl, she's rescued by a prince. Um, And then instead of wanting to sort of find and be with this prince, she decides she wants to become a prince because that was such a formative memory for her. And then she ends up fighting in this group over uh, the the Rose Bride, this character, Anthe, who whoever wins these these sword duels and you know the Rose Bride ends up belonging to them. So there's this very complicated uh, story about how the whole system seems very wrong, but also what can she do to pr- to protect Anthe, and um, you know how much of it is possessiveness. I mean, the, the whole show is is obviously an intentionally uh, queer and gender queer, and the way that that sort of she as a character explores her own presentation and um, and her own sexuality was really really resonant with me as a, um, as a genderqueer, not, uh, bisexual person in high school, so it really stuck with me. And there's a lot in Steven Universe that is heavily inspired by that show. Well, you know, because it, it used to be standard practice in this country to not allow any visible representation of queer people in media, which people should learn about this history, is that most production companies were not just complicit, but active and pr- producing the idea that queer people were pathological or wrong or dangerous, oftentimes the only representation of queer life we got was in Disney villains, right? Uh, people like Ursula. Life's full of tough choices, in it? was actually based off of a drag queen, um, Cruella de Vil. These kinds of forms of femininity that were not necessarily linked to domesticity or being at home, or femininity linked to like marriageability. So I think so much of my non-binary icons were these diva villains who I understood and had a deep resonant sense of being misunderstood um, and understanding that 
that we live in a society where if you have a relationship with your femininity that you own it and you're not apologizing for it. If you have a relationship with your femininity and it's not actually about trying to please men, of course people are going to demonize you. And I didn't have the language to understand that, but I felt this deep resonant sense of like a commitment to once again, I'm bringing up glit and grammar when I think about my girl Cruella. It's like the looks that she was serving, you knew she's been through some tragedy. You knew that you know that the only way that she could deliver the consistency of those looks was she had been she'd been struggling like me. SpongeBob SquarePants. 100% identify with Spon Spongebob. I mean, I think we all read Spongebob as a boy, right? But I always read Spongebob as like a f***ing sponge that was whatever he wanted to be on whatever day. <laughs> like, I never felt like Spongebob had a gender. Am I a pretty girl? Oh, well, um, you're, you're beautiful. Uh, <laughs> He was literally a sponge and he absorbed everything. I 100% embodied SpongeBob growing up. My mom bought me these knee high socks and I would run track with those socks. I'd play basketball with those socks. Like my nickname was SpongeBob at some point. Like I felt SpongeBob through and through in terms of just absorbing whatever kind of gender or whatever kind of presentation that he wanted to be on whatever day. And I mean, there were days when he was trying to be the muscle, the muscle bro. I love to be that person sometimes, but I don't want to be the me at all the time. Then he was playing with butterflies, and it's like, wow, a masculinity that I can actually get with, and it was like super cute. One specifically that's come up for me recently is, uh, you know, Gonzo. And now, Gonzo the Great. Thank you, thank you. I must have complete silence for this act, please. <clears throat> thank you. I shall now recite from the works of Percy Bysshe Shelley while, and at the same time, defusing this high explosive bomb. This is my experience of The Muppet Show for anyone who's unaware of the history of guns. <laughs> um, little Blue Alien, right? Like, I think that's also part of why looking back now, Gonzo is so non-binary to me is that Gonzo exists outside the even the binary of like human or animal on you know the, the Muppets or whatever. Nobody knows what Gonzo is but they also don't care. It's like as a child you see Gonzo and you're just like yep absolutely makes sense to me I don't need any more explanation shoot him out of a cannon like I'm into it you know and like that experience of just um accepting what is and then getting on board for what's behind that is really what uh you know the experience of of being non-binary is for me as layered as the answer might be rupaul when i was growing up and david bowie in labyrinth with all of this like shadow and like eyebrows are gone, you know, and hair all the way up to the ceiling and, and yeah, being the king of the goblins. I was really into that. Also, you know, <laughs> Wonder Woman, specifically Linda Carter's TV show. For only women have the necessary speed and coordination to attempt bullets and bracelets without the loss of life. Begin. Because she's, you know, going to go into the office. She's in a suit. She's in a pencil skirt. She's got her bag. Oh, somebody needs me? Let me just twirl around. And here is all of this like glam and fabulousness that also, by the way, can like deflect the bullets of life coming at you, right? And can also force other people to tell the truth when you, you know, lasso them. The whole superhero vibe is very much to me a mirror of the transformation we go through to tell the truth about who we are. 
That's episode two of Untold Stories Beyond the Binary. If you've loved hearing these reflections, make sure you check out the podcast version, all right? Everything's extended. We go a little bit more deeper. You get into all of our non-binary experiences, including a chat with artist, musician, Mickey Blanco. I understand why the canon is what it is or where I fit into it, but um, but I do think that there's going to be like a chapter after that, you know, which I'm living now. That's Untold Stories Beyond the Binary Podcast, available wherever you get Slayworthy audio. I'll see you next week. Slay on. Slay on.